Speeding Ghosts in China. The carpenter who has been making our new bookcase says he wants to go to his home for a few days. Some work is waiting him there. The Chinese writer says he wishes to go. There is a message to be sent in the direction of his village. He can carry it, and being at leisure, can spend a few days with his family. Our houseboy says he also must go. His, quote, mother, unquote, has been sick and is now, quote, more better, unquote, and he must go and see her. And so the carpenter and the writer have gone, and the boy is going. But it seems so strange. They're all asking to go at the same time that I suspect that at least part of them had some untold reason for it. And when I remind myself that it is now the last of August, that it is the time of the full moon, and that last night our Chinese neighbors were going about out of doors, carrying bowls of boiled rice, and that in front of the houses in the street nearby were little fires with those thin, filmy ash flakes that remain from burned paper scattered about them. I feel sure that I have guessed the reason, and that it is a wish to celebrate at their own homes the festival of burning clothes and the friendless ghosts' feast. The Chinese think that persons after they are dead need the same things as when they are alive, and that if they are not supplied with them, they can revenge themselves upon people in this world, bringing them ill health or bad luck in business. This being the case, of course, people try to keep the ghost of their relations in as comfortable and quiet a state as they can. If a father should die, his friends, while he remained unburied, would every day put a dish of rice and perhaps a basin of water by his coffin so that his ghost might eat and wash. Afterwards, they would at times carry food and drink to his grave, or place it before the wooden tablet, which, to honor him, would be set up in his house, to supply him with clothes and money or anything else he might need, like a house, a boat, or a chair. Paper imitations of these things would be made and burned, after which it would be thought the ghost could make use of them. Fifteen days at this season of the year are considered the most lucky time for making these offerings. Large quantities of clothes and other paper articles are then sold, and there is a great burning of them all over the country. Besides these well-to-do family ghosts, there is another class of whom people are dreadfully afraid. These are the spirits of very wicked men and of childless persons who have left nobody behind them in this world to care for them. They are supposed to be wandering about in a most forlorn condition and to be able to do a great deal of mischief. To put them in good humor and to induce them to keep out of the way of the living, a feast is made for them every summer. For several years past, this feast has been given in an open plot of ground just outside our yard and under our sitting room windows, so that I have often seen it, though I am obliged to say I have never spied any ghost coming to eat of it. Every year the ceremonies are the same. Early in the day, four tall poles are planted in the ground about a dozen feet apart and so placed as to mark a square. About twenty feet from the ground, a wooden floor is built between the poles. A few men who stand upon this platform direct everything. Usually, one or two of them seem to be priests. Once I recognized the leader as an expert juggler, whose tricks I had witnessed only a short time before. A part of the feast has been made ready beforehand, and is at once arranged on the platform. At two corners are placed ornamented cones, six or eight feet high, which I suppose it is expected will appear to the ghost to be solid cakes, but which are, in reality, only bamboo frames thinly plastered over with a mixture of flour and sugar. Besides these, 
are green oranges, other fresh fruits, and articles of different kinds. Soon, offerings of food begin to come in from the neighborhood and are drawn up by ropes to the platform. These are mostly baskets of boiled rice and have a bit of wood holding a red paper stuck in the middle of the rice. I suppose the giver's name is upon the paper. And after the feast, the baskets seem to be restored to the persons who brought them. The rice can then be taken away and eaten at home. At length, the platform is well laden with food, which remains exposed in the sun and wind for several hours, during which time a great noise is kept up with gongs and other musical instruments, partly, I suppose, like a dinner bell to call the ghost, and partly to amuse the men and boys who gather in an interested crowd around the platform. Late in the afternoon, the headmen begin to distribute the feast. The baskets of food are carefully lowered, the cakes are broken up, and the pieces, with the oranges and other fruits, are flung hither and thither among the crowd, who scramble merrily after them, sometimes half a dozen rushing after the same fragment. And now and then, a man trying to clamber up the poles to secure a portion before it falls. When the stage is cleared, the crowd disperses, and the ghost feast is ended. In this region, the people are very poor. But in a large and rich community, this festivity would be kept with splendor even, and with much cost. Last year, a part of the wooden framework fell, and one man was injured. I think this may make the old ground seem unlucky to the Chinese, and lead them to seek a new place for this year's feast. Let us hope that they will do so. For to have a set of the most wicked and unhappy ghosts asked to dinner under one's windows is not, after all, so amusing as it is noisy and sadly foolish. End of section 6